Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to MDA's Trail Lab. So we got an exciting uh, discussion today about some efforts that are underway as part of the, uh, the, the uh, lab here at MDA and as well that hopefully will lead into some really cool artificial intelligence algorithms being developed by hopefully you for Canada Arm 3. So uh, I'm joined here by a number of different panelists and I'm gonna start off by introducing Daniel Gaudreau. He's the uh, CSA software and avionics lead and he's gonna tell us a little bit about the Gateway program. Daniel? Uh, thank you, Cam. Um, yeah, I'm going to quickly go over a description of the Syslunar Gateway, which is the uh, technological environment uh, in which um, uh, AI-enabled technologies uh, will be deployed, including uh, Canon Arm 3. So next slide, please. Uh, the Gateway uh, has been proposed in 2017 by NASA uh, as an outpost for uh, orbiting the moon that will provide vital support for a sustainable long-term human return to the moon, as well as a uh, staging point for deep space exploration. It's a critical component of the NASA's uh, Artemis program that you may have heard about. The Gateway will also be a science lab, a test bed for new technologies, a uh, rendezvous location for exploration of the surface of the moon, a mission center for operations on the moon uh, that includes uh, human uh, and uh, rover missions. And one day uh, it will be a stepping stone for trips to Mars. Next slide, please. What does the gateway look like? Uh, well, it looks uh, on the long term, it will look like this. Uh, so if you click the next slide, yeah. So we uh, are looking at uh, all the different modules that constitute the gateway. Uh, the ones that are labeled in yellow will be put together first. Uh, and uh, the other modules uh, labeled with uh, white red and the blue will come later on in the sustaining phase. And uh, you can see in red the uh, Canada contribution to the gateway, which is the Canada Arm tree that we also call GERS internally for gateway external robotic system. Next slide, please. The uh, gateway program will be uh, deployed in two major phases. The first phase is called the initial capability and will enable the uh, associated Artemis program to uh, complete its first uh, critical, critical step. And uh, uh, it will prioritize the uh, accommodation of the Orion spacecraft and the human lander system. Uh, they, will, it, they will dock to uh, permanent uh, PPE uh, for uh, power and propulsion element and the habitation and logistic outpost called a HALO as well. Um, phase two is the sustaining capability where uh, contributions from the other international partners will be added, including uh, Canada's gateway external robotic system uh, to fully support crude and autonomous operation. Next slide. Some interesting facts and dates. Uh, the uh, Gateway uh, Space Station will be about a sixth of the size of ISS, which is much bigger than the Gateway. Uh, it will orbit around the moon uh, on a near rectilinear halo orbit. It's kind of a very uh, elliptic orbit um, that is fuel efficient and uh, has advantages for communication line of sight. It will be crewed initially uh, only one month per year, maybe longer later on. Um, autonomy demonstration goal uh, is uh, 21 days without any human inter intervention, although autonomy will be uh, uh, important uh, all the time. Communication delay from Earth to Moon is about 1.3 seconds, then obviously the same time from Moon to Earth. Um, the first launch in the uh, assembly sequence is the PPE HALO launch that is uh, scheduled for May 2024. And the Canada Arm 3 uh, elements will arrive at the gateway uh, around the third quarter of uh, 2026. But uh, we're already working on 
the detailed design and implementation of the uh, robotics interfaces that will need to be spread across uh, the phase one uh, gateway elements to support uh, robotics operation. Uh, avionics will be uh, ethernet based and uh, MDA got the contract for phase A in December, 2020. Next slide, please. So Canadarm3 uh, will deploy and retrieve external utilization payloads. Uh, it will uh, be equipped to inspect the gateway. Uh, it will be able to capture, uh, birth, uh, relocate uh, modules or you know, capture free uh, flyer spacecraft. We'll do contingency maintenance and support the astronaut EVA. I'm now going to turn over to Dr. Chris Langley, who is the AI and Autonomy Architect for Canada Arm Tree at NDA. Over to you, Chris. We don't hear you, Chris. Okay, so um, I'm not sure what's happened to Chris. So um, I'll just walk you through. So this is basically the new space strategy for Canada. Can you click here? So within this strategy, um, the term AI enabled is uh, peppered all throughout. And I think it actually appears more times than um, the word robot uh, does, which is, which is quite amazing for a system like this. So um, we're trying to, obviously, the end goal is to make this as autonomous as possible. And as Daniel has mentioned, such that uh, this will help us to further our goals towards beyond uh, cislunar orbit and towards Mars. Next slide. So the question is, what is considered AI? Um, so what we're looking at is algorithms that mimic cognitive functions. So um, when the system does something smart, uh, so we're I, taking it. Oh, you got, you're on, Chris? Uh, yeah, I'm back. Sorry, that was the, uh, the perfect time for my internet connection to drop out. Um, how's my audio? Am I coming through clearly? Yeah, I got five. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you for, for in for me, Cam. Um, yes, as you, as you saw on the previous slide, um, AI is, is going to be a big deal. So we need to start by um, defining what do we really mean by AI. So at MDA, we take an inclusive definition. Anything where a machine is doing a uh, cognitive or perceptual type decision-making function uh, that we would normally associate with the human mind, um, we call that uh, AI. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first is that as systems engineers, we don't want to presuppose a solution. We want to use uh, machine learning where machine learning is uh, appropriate. Um, and we want to use other algorithms where they are better. Um, sorry, I can't, is somebody trying to get my attention or is it just feedback? Uh, nope, just continue. Okay, sorry, thanks. Um, the second, and something that you may have um, experienced um, in your own work, is that um, once a problem in AI is solved, it's no longer considered part of AI, which is really doing a disservice to the work that went into uh, creating that solution. And third, um, it's a very clear way to differentiate Canada from its predecessors and highlight a lot of the innovative work that is uh, going on. There's innovations going on in every domain, mechanical, electrical, software for the, the Canada M3, but this is a, a particularly interesting nugget. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, comparing it um, to its predecessors and seeing what's new, we want to uh, take a look at how do we do things today? This slide shows two images from the robotics control rooms that exist at um, the CSA headquarters in Saint-Hubert. Um, on the left, we have the robotics officer who is uh, actively controlling the Canada Arm 2 and Dexter. And as you can see, she has access to all of the live downlinked videos. Um, there's a, a, a lot of alphanumeric uh, information being displayed. Um, and she's issuing commands uh, line by line 
from a pre-validated procedure and then checking the responses of the, uh, the on-orbit system. Uh, meanwhile, in the uh, other room, there are a number of uh, domain experts who are not sending commands, but are also watching the telemetry and making sure that the system behavior is correct. And so both of these, um, both of these sets of operators have moment-to-moment -moment situation awareness of how the operation is unfolding. And uh, this is a very safe and very effective way of controlling the, um, uh, the robotics. Uh, it's been used for over 20 years on, on ISS alone. Um, but you'll note that it's like one um, key assumption, which is that you have near constant communication link with the spacecraft as you're doing these operations. And as we'll see, uh, talk about on the next slide, uh, when that assumption gets violated, um, there's a number of knock-on effects. So if we look at um, the mission requirements, um, why do we need autonomy in AI? Uh, is it just because it's a buzzword or is there actual real reasons in the mission that, that drive it? And this is um, what's shown here. First of all, um, as Danielle mentioned, there will be crew on board. Um, so we need to meet all of the rigorous safety standards that are necessary for human space flight. Um, but there will only be humans on board one month out of the year. So for the other 11 months, uh, Gateway has to take care of itself. It can't rely on uh, direct human physical interaction. Um, next, we're using a different communication um, infrastructure to talk to Gateway than we do to talk to ISS and that has a uh, lower uh, bandwidth. Um, and in addition, we will have um, more losses of signal using this. And operations will need to continue um, even when we don't have comms. And then to make things even more interesting, when Gateway gets to um, its sort of final configuration and everything's been checked out, the idea is to really push for a Mars forward type philosophy. Um, so we would have as little as one eight hour communication window per week. So during the other six days, um, the robotics is on its own, the station's on its own, and it all has to keep functioning. So this leads to a lot of interesting areas where AI can be applied. Um, first, um, because we're operating during loss of signal, uh, we need to have that autonomous execution capability and the ability to recover from any faults that happen um, as we're doing our execution. We also need to have um, systems to close the loop on board, perceptual systems. So as the gateway um, flexes and changes with um, the thermal and pressure environment, where those robotic interfaces are, will move slightly. So we need to uh, close all of those loops and feed that back into the control system. We'll also, sorry. Um, next click, please. You might be just lagging a bit, Chris. Um, okay. We'll also oh, there we go. Uh, need to be able to um, to monitor, and we'll need to be able to monitor its own performance and tell when it's working properly. Um, and finally, because we don't have that moment to motion within that uh, eight hour mission. Um, so at those points, you have uh, I think we might have lost Chris again. I think this is his last slide. Aaron, can you progress? Yes, that's my last slide. Oh, I'd there like he is. There he is. <laughs> 
Sorry about that. I'd like to introduce uh, Spencer Murray, who's the uh, Director of Communications and Public Relations at Amy. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so as Chris mentioned, I'm Spencer. I'm the Director of Communications and Public Relations at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, or what we like to call AMI. And I'm going to talk a little bit about building Canada's AI ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. AMI is one of uh, three centers of excellence in the pan-Canadian AI strategy. Um, which was launched in March of 2017, really with the focus of attracting and retaining top academic talent here in the country in order to make Canada and set up the, the country as a world leading destination for companies that are looking to invest in AI. Um, Canada was the first country to launch a national AI strategy. And that really just shows that sort of national excellence that we've had in this area. Um, and I really want to talk today about um, the, uh, this, this sort of connection between academia and industry. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. Amy really sits in the middle of these, these kinds of two interesting spaces where we're, we're working to support and advance leading edge research in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and also to translate that scientific advancement into industry adoption and economic impact for the country. Um, it's really interesting to be sort of in this space where we're helping to push forward the, the next generation of science and, and to train up that next generation of scientists, but also to find ways to, to help industry adopt those technologies into the work that they're doing. Uh, next slide, please. Over the past two decades, we've really spent a lot of time building a world-class AI community here in Alberta and across the country as well. Uh, we were founded in 2002 as you know, a small research group at the University of Alberta. There was just four people at the time. And it was thanks to funding from the government of Alberta that we were able to start attracting and retaining lots of academic talent. Folks like Richard Sutton, who is our chief scientific advisor and who's also a leader in the field of reinforcement learning, uh, as well as people like Michael Bowling, uh, Rich, um, Dale Shermans, uh, and, and a number of others who started to come to the country in order to, to gain access to um, some of what we have going on here. Uh, over the next years, there was a lot of uh, technical advancements and, and more researchers being brought onto the team. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. And then it's really been in the last five years that we've seen a sort of acceleration in the pace of work that's happening here in Canada. Um, the, we saw the launch of the pan-Canadian AI strategy in 2017. Um, and since then, we've seen a lot of companies and corporate investments starting to come into Canada, uh, in large part thanks to that strategy and some of the impacts that it's been able to create. You know, I mentioned that Amy in 2002 started as a, a four-person research group, and we've now grown to have over 30 primary researchers who are all part of uh, the work that we're doing. Um, next slide, please. And like I say, this is really bringing, you know, this strategy and all of the work that we're doing in AI excellence in Canada is really bringing the world to Canada's door. We're seeing a lot of interest from, you know, countries everywhere across the world, all the continents, um, really coming to Canada to try to gain access to some of the talent that we have and some of the latest, greatest technologies that are coming out of places like our academic institutions, as well as some of the really innovative companies that are, are building uh, really great work here, uh, folks like MDA, for example. Um, um, next slide, please. And this is really, uh, you know, Amy's work uh, that we focus with industry and how we're helping to build out that ecosystem is really on helping companies move along the AI adoption spectrum in order to build their own internal AI capabilities so that they can embark on whatever solution it is that they need to develop based on their own needs within the organization. And this could mean that we're working with companies who come to us with, you know, data all written down in, in handwritten ledgers, wondering how can I get some, some value out of what we've collected over the last little while, all the way through to companies like MDA, for example, who are needing to push the boundaries of where AI has taken us so far in order to be able to integrate it into next generation technologies like what we're talking about here today. Um, next slide, please. So Amy really works to, to build out the AI ecosystem in, in kind of four main areas of impact. Uh, the first and the thing that we've uh, been long known for is our uh, work propelling leading edge research, whether that be directly in academia on curiosity driven fundamental research or working with industry partners on advanced research and, and rapid adoption of AI technologies. Next slide, please. We also work to upskill uh, people for the careers of the future, whether that be working in academia to, to train up the next generation of scientists or working with people who maybe are looking for new opportunities uh, for their, their uh, knowledge that they already have and looking to just give themselves that extra edge to get into those, those careers of the future. Next slide, please. 
We also work with that talent in order to connect them to top companies, um, to make sure that everyone around the world really knows that Canada is the place to be if you want to access that next great AI talent, and if you want to start incorporating AI into your, your operations. Um, this is really the place that you need to be to gain access to those resources that you need. Next slide, please. And the final piece of work that Amy does is really on building our uh, industry capacity for AI. So this is really looking like helping them scope out projects and, and move forward their own AI initiatives um, with the, the support and guidance of Amy experts and, and researchers on our teams. Next slide. And that really brings us to sort of where we're at today with MDA. Uh, we're really excited about the, the launch of this data set that we're seeing. Um, it's a, a difficult thing to get really high quality data from, from difficult to access environments. And so it's exciting for a lot of AI researchers who are part of Amy to, to be able to have access to this type of data set uh, going forward. Um, next slide. Uh, thank you so much for giving us some time to chat today. I'm now going to introduce Louis Bourgeois, who's here from the NRC, the National Research, Research Council of Canada. Uh, he is the Acting Director of Research and Development at the Digital Technologies Research Centre. Okay, thank you. So Spencer just gave an excellent in-depth view of how one key part of the AI ecosystem works. I wanted to take just a few minutes to give a slightly broader view of the Canadian AI ecosystem and of associated federal funding strategies and opportunities. Uh, and finally, give a few perspective on how this great data set that's being released today fits in all of it. So next slide, please. So there have been many attempts at illustrating the thriving AI Canadian ecosystem in one slide. Uh, I, I like this one very much as a way to illustrate both the depth and breadth of the Canadian AI environment. So our AI ecosystem does build on our strong academic hubs that host some of the great pioneer of AI, with certainly Amy at the core, but many other strong academic hubs across the country. It, also builds on the numerous nonprofits and governments at all level who fund and work at connecting those universities with incubators, accelerators, startups, investors to create that extremely dynamic but also very large and complex environment. Uh, the ecosystem is obviously a fundamental part in keeping Canadian innovators and industry competitive as AI and analytics are now uh, at the core of innovation in, in pretty much every domain. Uh, what I wanted to quickly show more specifically was some of the major pathways where the, the government of Canada is investing in AI uh, with a focus uh, obviously on automation uh, and AI applied to robotics as this is important today. Uh, next slide, please. So Spencer has already described in more detail the pan-Canadian AI strategy that Amy is a major part of. But that, that strategy uh, led by Sarfar, uh, Sarfar, while absolutely central to the AI ecosystem, is actually a small part of the federal investment in AI. Other key, another key part of, uh, of, of this strategy is the innovation superclusters. So this is the image to the right. Th those five innovation clusters are built around strategic teams, each of them individually funded at a level that's actually similar to the, the pan-Canadian AI strategy itself, uh, with operation models that are different, but that also aim at connecting research and industry uh, around those important challenges and involve many of the same players, including those present here today. So AI applied to robotics and automation is actually a key part of many of the superclusters. Uh, the digital supercluster in Vancouver has a strong digital twinning and learning factories focus. The uh, advanced manufacturing supercluster uh, based in Ontario also addresses automation and digital manufacturing. And the scale AI uh, cluster in Montreal uh, supports robotic innovation from a warehousing and logistic perspective. Uh, in uh, maybe a third major path, the National Research Council, uh, actually of which I'm from, has sister programs to all superclusters to actually fund lower TRL research in support of those superclusters uh, in collaboration with academia and SMEs. And our uh, research assistance uh, program uh, uh, that support SMEs has a special program to actually fund AI adoption in SMEs through many of uh, other AI ecosystem participants, again, including Amy. 
So Chris has illustrated clearly also earlier that Canada Arm 3 is part of Canada's uh, AI innovation strategy, which take us here today. Uh, next slide, please. And now uh, quickly moving back to today's release of the trail data set. Uh, I, I do need to state that even if I'm here today, NRC was not involved in, in that specific work, but we are closely involved with CSA, uh, CSA and their partners uh, on their Canada Arm endeavor. CSA actually uh, branched out of NRC long ago and both branches of NRC work with them on many AI teams, uh, some of them listed here. Uh, so, as a segue to say a few words about the trail data set, I've added a few images from positioning and inspection tasks using 3D imaging from work uh, done by NEPTEC, now, now part of MDA, and NRC's vision team uh, for the past generation of Canadarm and the space program. Chris has actually already presented earlier some of the major and sometimes unique challenge associated with a robotic space vision and especially the gateway project. So I, I won't go too much there, but uh, working with this great data set and ultimately developing a reliable autonomy solution for the gateway will be both a great academic research opportunity and a major applied challenge. And it's also a great opportunity to help address both industrial automation challenges and to be a key contributor uh, in the lunar gateway uh, AI challenge component. So this is all very exciting. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, I would now like to introduce Dr. Cameron Dickinson, who is the MDA, MDA Vision System Architect for uh, Canada Arm 3. So Cameron. Thank you, Louis. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. I'm here in the, uh, the trail lab. Um, I'm going to start, though, by talking a little bit about the philosophy that was kind of put into the thought that was put into creating trail. So although this is a specific example today about uh, how a robot could avoid an obstacle uh, using a vision uh, solution, um, in general, what we're trying to do is trying to tease out different problems that uh, may arise or, or, or technology gaps that may arise on Canada Arm 3 and how we can address them and if the right fit is AI. Um, and, and so we're not limited to just using a robot and cameras we're looking at this across the board in terms of uh, other elements, such as the ground segment, uh, planning uh, of, of robotic motions, um, as well as basically all the different sectors that Chris has laid out um, for the Canada Arm 3. We're looking to see if there's ways that we can, um, you know, if AI is the best solution, how we can progress the technology on that. And this even extends beyond sort of the initial build um, and deployment of Canada Arm 3, we're looking way out into the future and ways that we can sort of uh, build the AI ecosystem up and sort of around robotics and vision systems. So I'll give you a little bit of some of the specifics of this. Uh, this is what we hope is the first of several data sets. And this data set is focused on obstacle avoidance. So basically, uh, right now I'm standing in what we call our uh, uh, ground bed test lab. Uh, it's, it also serves a purpose as what we call our dreamer lab for um, augmented reality and virtual reality. And it's sort of our multi-purpose room for robots um, in, uh, at MDA. So this robot uh, that's next to me is a six degree of freedom robot. It's actually a prototype for what's on the International Space Station, the uh, Dexter robot. Um, we've used this for a number of different operations over the years, and it really is our, our workhorse for trialing out new operations that will eventually deploy on orbit. So what we've done to, uh, here is we've basically set up the lab um, to uh, the, the lab with a series of cameras to uh, video the robot in motion. And the goal of this particular uh, trail data set was to create an AI ready data set that could just be pushed out to researchers. So um, as we've been going through the program, we've come to realize that we have lots of data on things, but often the data isn't perhaps in a format that's readily accessible to AI researchers. So we've been working uh, with our partners at Amy um, to, to make that data AI as an AI enabled as we possibly can so that researchers, such as hopefully those that are watching this webinar, can then immediately take and deploy and start working on uh, maybe different algorithms for how we can approach this problem. 
So uh, besides the robot, you can see that I'm completely surrounded by green screens. This is to remove the uh, busy background of the lab um, in which the robot sits. Um, it's, it's hard to see, but just above me, there's uh, a series of cameras. So we have about eight ultra high definition cameras. That's a 4K camera um, that produce scene imagery. Um, there's another additional three uh, HD videos which um, also reside, one of them resides on the robot uh, end effector itself. And these provide all the different views um, of, of the robot in motion that we could sort of conceive of and is sort of our starting point for this data set. Um, what's not seen is there's a target that the robot, um, if you watch through the videos, the, the robot doesn't quite connect with, but it comes close. And then um, there's an obstacle that um, our, uh, our intern, uh, Aaron Richardson, who's going to talk next, moved around and basically uh, created a, a series of uh, robotic operations, both with the obstacle in play and with it out of play, and with it in the view and with it not in the view, and all the sort of permutations of that. And she'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So, um, yeah, so basically, after this, we, we just ran the robot. Um, and, and again, Aaron will talk you through the details, but multiple times to build up a really nice data set where uh, we're, we're hoping that researchers such as yourself um, can engage with us and, um, and sort of help us look at this, this problem of obstacle avoidance. Um, at the end of the webinar, there is a, a, an email address that will be put up. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with us at, uh, at MDA about future potential projects relating to Canada Arm 3 or ideas, uh, please feel free to use trail at mda.space and get in, in touch with us. We're looking to uh, connect with uh, new groups as many, you know, and, and sort of start talking through ideas of how we might grow this, uh, this trail idea out even further. Okay, and with that, I will turn things over to Aaron Richardson, who is our uh, intern and is actually the one that uh, operated the robot um, for, to create this data set. Hi everyone, my name is Erin. I'm a student intern here at MDA and had the awesome opportunity of working on this first data set in the trail lab. So like Kim mentioned, the goal of this first data set was to teach Canada Arm 3 collision avoidance. So using the model of the dexterous robot on board the ISS, we drove this robot through a whole bunch of different trajectories to a target destination. Um, and these trials serve as training data for cases that are nominal so that we would want to emulate on orbit or off nominal cases that we would want to avoid. So for example, if the robot remains clear of a potential obstacle, um, we can teach a future AI that that is a good case. Um, and if it comes too close to an obstacle, we can teach it that that is marked as a collision and that we would want to avoid that in the future. A quick overview. So we collected 330 trials and the robot um, was in collision with an obstacle for about a third of those. So I'm going to give you a sneak peek of what the video data looks like. So you can see um, nine of the different camera views we collected. So we wanted to make sure we could um, see the action from all areas of the workspace. And from this, hopefully also learn um, what views are useful in detecting collisions on orbit. So I'll just play that for you once more. Um, all of these videos collected from the different trials will be available in the data set. And here you can see we have one obstacle right underneath the robot um, that it passes on its way to the target. So I'm gonna show you some examples of different cases we made sure to cover in our data set. So we ran cases where there was no obstacle in sight, there is an obstacle underneath the robot, an obstacle to the left, one to the right, uh, smaller obstacles or different shaped ob obstacles, and even from above. So here you can see a little tennis ball hanging above the target destination. So like Cam mentioned, we outfitted the lab with green screens. Um, we made sure to cover a variety of different obstacle conditions as well as lighting conditions. And we also drove the robot through different trajectories from different starting points to the target destination because we wanted to make sure that we covered a variety of conditions that the robotic arm would face on orbit. So now getting to the actual data set, it is available on Kaggle, which is a public um, web-based data platform. So you can access it via this link or the QR code. 
we'll also be sending out the link to the data set to all of the webinar participants afterwards. And due to the large amount of video data, we've split the data set into 12 different parts. So here you can see what the first one looks like. So you can go through and download all 12. And then I'm just going to give you a bit more information into what is actually contained in this data set. So for each set of trials, we have um, MP4 video files filmed from 11 different cameras. There's a MATLAB, a MATLAB script that will parse each of those videos and save a PNG of each frame um, in a trial of interest. We provide metadata. So there are CSV files that indicate which frames um, the robot is in collision with an obstacle and where it's not in collision, as well as robot telemetry collected through all of these trials and a readme file that contains information on the dataset contents and its usage. And one last thing is that Trail would love to hear from you. So whether now or when you start to work with the dataset, feel free to reach out at trail at mda.space. And we'd be happy to take any questions now so you can use the Q&A feature in the Zoom chat and ask our panelists any questions. Okay, so our first question is, how would the space industry, MDA and others, look in the next five to 10 years? With NASA's Perseverance rover and Ingenuity doing wonders right now, is space industry up for disruption, like iPhone did for smartphone during 2006 to seven? Anyone wanna take that, Daniel? Yeah, I can probably, uh try to uh, have an answer for that. It's quite an open question, actually, um, and an interesting one. Uh, I think there's already a, uh, a uh, private company in the environment that is uh, part of disrupting the traditional uh, way of doing uh, space business. This company is called uh, SpaceX, and uh, that definitely is a uh, uh, an indication that uh, the, the model of doing business for, for space is uh, evolving and uh, other innovations uh, can come through through that model. Although uh, uh, they, um, what we've heard today and uh, what we've seen today also indicates that, you know, there, there's a definitely a will for uh, uh, convergence of the, uh, uh, different know-how from uh, uh, research institutes and uh, private companies in Canada to also uh, come up with, uh, uh, let's call it disruptive ideas. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we, can, we can see that from in the five to 10 years uh, horizon, there, things are going to happen for sure. We don't know exactly how or when, but um, certainly looks, uh, it's an exciting period. Maybe I'll just jump in quickly to sort of echo some of the things that, uh, that Daniel's saying, um, especially around, you know, the kind of bringing together different groups uh, and, and creating these sort of disruptive ideas. I think, you know, if you think about the last five years, uh, the world has changed a lot thanks to things like artificial intelligence. And I think we're seeing more and more the, uh, the proof is sort of in the pudding for some of those technologies these days. Um, and so there's a lot of really exciting work that can continue to happen. And I think there's lots of, lots of opportunities uh, when it comes to thinking about problems in new ways, uh, thanks to things like artificial intelligence. Um, I just want to quickly mention that, you know, Canada is, is one of the countries that has a lot of expertise in an area called reinforcement learning, um, sort of a, a, an up and coming area of artificial intelligence, which has huge implications for this sort of work in terms of, you know, automation and, and decision control and support. Um, so lots of disruption can be coming, uh, but Canada can, can lead the way in a, in a lot of those cases. Yeah, I should probably just add on to that one, one thing. Uh, that sort of, uh, it, there's a, basically a technological uh, limitation when you're sending hardware and space uh, that sort of uh, not, does not slow down, but uh, uh, kind of tempers the, 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 the rate of uh, new technology in production. So it's basically the space environment and the environment is a rough place for electronics especially uh, highly integrated microprocessors with super tiny transistors. Uh, they're really um, 
they're really sensitive to uh, uh, radiation, space radiation. So uh, it uh, it does not invalidate the ideas, uh, the disruptive ideas that are proposed uh, per se, but it makes their implementation more gradual and uh, uh, more. Uh, we need to to especially if uh, human uh, operators or uh, crew is involved, uh, we will also need to be super careful about how we implement these things so that uh, we, uh, we can ensure safety. So yeah, it's, it's challenging. It's a real challenge. Okay, our next question is whether the data set can be applied to an urban situation, for example, avoiding vehicle collision on streets. Chris, do you want to have a go at that? Um, my feeling would be that that would be a different domain. Uh, we'd be looking at uh, entirely different things in the image and uh, different behaviors of the object. I don't see that there would necessarily be a uh, an applicability of this data set to that domain. And I, I'd add that there are probably data sets more appropriate already existing for that problem. Okay, one interesting question is what sort of limitations, so for example, technical or hardware, should we account for in running the model on our own device? Um, I can talk about that um, for a little bit. Um, for for in terms of uh, research, um, is uh, be open, um, run it on the device that you think uh, will give you interesting results and will lead to good research papers. Um, as we start to think more about getting it into the Canada Arm Three system, uh, that's where uh, the rubber is really going to hit the road um, because, uh, like Daniel mentioned, environment is is really key. Um, all the processors need to be uh, radiation tolerant. Um, they also need uh, low power uh, in terms of uh, their compute. Um, so things like um, FPGAs have a, a good heritage of uh, radiation hardening and use in, in deep space. Um, people are starting to look at using GPUs um, in the space environment, but that's um, a little bit behind. Um, so uh, all this to say uh, that a solution that works uh, on a desktop uh, may not quite fit into Canada Arm 3. It's the type of thing where we could start looking at, well, what are the effects of reducing the size of the, the model um, such that it fits on the processors that are on board? Um, anyone else want to uh, add in on? Okay, another question. So we have cost effectiveness is key to new missions as seen from the success of recent missions of ISRO to the moon slash Mars. Would AI enable Canada to reduce the cost of space exploration and also enable them to push the boundaries? I, I can have a go at that one. Um, I, I think uh, definitely. So um, as we sort of incorporate more of these intelligent systems, um, it reduces, for example, the need uh, for uh, kind of human interaction. Uh, we can get more bang for our buck, basically, for it with some of these robotic applications than, um, you know, as we move forward. So as we do that, that will drive down the cost of, um, you know, performing this. It's not to remove uh, astronauts. It's more probably to augment and to increase their capability, uh, for example, with, with some of these uh, situations or where the environment is perhaps too hazardous and right now where we might um you know we we have a solution um, but that would be so intensive to do it, it 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 just wouldn't make sense so as we start building out this ai capability and kind of increasing on efficiencies as we've all talked about here today um you know we'll start to see gains uh in different areas to explore and we can probably 
as I've said, to kind of get more bang for a buck uh, in, in the systems that are deployed to solve these types of problems. There are a few uh, data set specific questions that I can answer. So someone asked if there are any moving obstacles, not in this data set, all of the obstacles were stationary with the robotic arm moving. Um, someone asked if there's obstacles ever in the robot's way and yes, sometimes the robot actually brushes the obstacle on its way to the target. And were the lighting conditions changed for the data set? Yes, we had big spotlights that we would move around um, different positions relative to the robot um, and also covered overhead lighting conditions on or off. I just wanted to add to that. Well, I, I met, forgot to mention that during my uh, portion earlier, but uh, lighting is actually extremely important. Um, it's probably more important on the International Space Station just because it's more variable, but the gateway still will see some lighting changes that, um, and, and that will play an important part on how these algorithms are developed. And we have tried to, into the trail data set, incorporate a variety of uh, lighting conditions to mimic that at some level. So, great question. Um, I, I can't help but to add another nerdy comment on this. It's actually difficult for both space stations for different reasons. Um, ISS, um, the lighting conditions are constantly changing. So as you're doing a particular op, your shadows can be moving around, but it does give you the advantage that if you need to wait for a uh, favorable lighting condition, you can always wait half an orbit or something and, um, and get to a good condition. Whereas gateway, um, every quasi-static. So if you find yourself in a good lighting condition on the day that your operation is great, um, if not, you are stuck. You have to do that op no matter what uh, conditions you see at the time. So that's a uh, yeah, good point. Thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about the team working on this and whether there are opportunities for viewers to contribute or get involved? Yeah, so this is exactly what the, what the goal of TRAIL is is we want researchers, we want SMEs to reach out to us and to connect on the data set. And, um, you know, depending on sort of what the best interaction is, we would try to move forward. It could just be a simple thing as downloading the data set if you're a researcher and deploying it. Um, but if there's other technologies that you might have, uh, perhaps as an SME that could contribute, then we definitely would like to hear from you. And we'd like to, you know, have discussions about how uh, we can, you know, look at using this data set um, in, an, in an intelligent way, not to be afraid to have a pun, but, um, but to use it to maximum effect uh, for this type of problem. Um, we're also, as I mentioned before, looking for uh, both academic and industry you know, groups to engage with us if they have thoughts on other elements of Canadarm3, where um, artificial intelligence could help solve some of the challenges or the technology gaps. Um, and, and basically, you know, as I mentioned, we're hoping to this, that this is not the uh, first, this is, we're hoping that this is the first of several data sets that we can uh, deploy to uh, address a number of different uh, technology gaps um, or different issues uh, on, on gate, uh, Gateway and uh, Canada Arm 3. On Earth, we often debate centralized or edge computing. With distant space environments, would it always be best to have distributed computing to provide defense in depth redundancy? I think I can try to answer that. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, it's definitely a goal to have a redundancy uh, on uh, space uh, computing assets, uh, especially if the uh, system is uh, involved in uh, safety uh, related uh, functions. So um, I would not call it distribution by default, but definitely uh, redundancy uh, in uh, main controlling units. Um, as uh, redundancy uh, in, uh, I would say, no, so, sorry, not redundancy, but distribution, uh, it's interesting because uh, if we want to augment, if we're if we're looking at augmenting traditional uh, computing and governance with uh, um, uh, added uh, added CPUs that would uh, 
that would uh, definitely augment the capability or the efficiency of a, a specific uh, robotic task. Yes, uh, th this is becoming uh, interesting and there are some uh, uh, platforms that we're actually looking at to uh, integrate in the main controlling units that, that would uh, operate sort of on a, a different priority level to um, provide data to the main algorithms for uh, added efficiency. Maybe Chris can uh, tell us a bit, a bit more about that, but uh, it's kind of the idea. So the main core, the, the main uh, core functionality is uh, more traditional based in terms of computing and the um, AI uh, augmented uh, functions would be uh, more distributed. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really have uh, any more to uh, to add to it than that. Um, yeah, the it's a it's a human spaceflight uh, program, so we have to make sure that all the software follows the um, the rigorous safety requirements. It's easier to do that kind of VNV &V on traditional software, so it would be the uh, the main gatekeeper and the main control of the robotics, uh, but then be able to call on. The performance of um, an AI enabled function uh, to get the job done, then, then that works. Okay, we have some questions about differences between this setup and the one that will be on orbit for Canada Arm 3. Mm -hmm. So, differences between this robotic arm, for example, degrees of freedom, joints, and links of the robot in the trail data set compared to Canada Arm 3, um, as well as our cameras use representative flight cameras, for example, the field of view and location relative to operations. Okay, uh, I can take that one. Um, yeah, there is not a one-to-one -one, um, between uh, this lab and Gateway for a couple of reasons. Um, first, it was built um, many, many years ago and is just um, existent, whereas we're still designing um, the Canada Arm 3 system. Uh, this robot, as Cam mentioned, is six degree of freedom. The um, Canada Arm 3 robots will be um, seven DOF. Um, we don't actually know where the um, uh, facility cameras will be on the gateway modules yet. We have some initial ideas, but they, they're free to move um, as those module uh, designs get more and more mature. Um, we tried to pick fields of view for the camera that were at least somewhat representative of what we have been considering for Canada Arm 3, but again, those are still in design iteration process. So I would say that the motions of the arm and the fields of view um, would be uh, within the right ballpark, within the right domain or regime for Canada Arm 3, but not necessarily exactly the same. So someone is asking how the data set compares to existing data sets for in situ navigation or control solutions. Um, and if we can comment on the gap between simulation and reality and how we can address it in the long run. Um, I can take a, a stab at the, the latter uh, part of that question. Um, and that's something that we're actually working on right now and coming up with the uh, the plan for how we're going to um, solve the, the reality gap. Um, so definitely for Canada Arm 3, the intent is to be able to run um, high quality uh, simulations uh, beforehand, which includes uh, mix of the arm, um, lighting conditions of the, um, the work sites so that we can generate uh, representative data sets that we can use for initial training of models. And then as we get um, more data from the hardware test beds to be able to retune that and, and validate that simulation. And again, once we get onto on orbit um, uh, to take the uh, data sets there that we know and anticipate will best benefit um, retraining or uh, transfer learning for the um, AI algorithms. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, um, one of the challenges that we've found looking at data from the International Space Station is the robot, the Canada Arm 2 has obviously uh, been operated so successfully, we don't have a lot of cases where the robot, for example, with something like collision avoidance, where it did actually collide with something. So the use of simulators, um, as Chris has just mentioned, 
I think is going to be a key aspect for us to, you know, prove out these corner cases where, um, or, or cases that we want to generally avoid um, for, uh, for, for operations. Aaron, could you repeat the first question in that set? Let me just find the question. It was about um, how it compares to existing data sets for in situ navigation or control solutions. And they gave an example of speed from Stanford. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think we can answer that. I'm not yeah, I, I can't comment on that. Um, I, I don't have familiar. But, but if you do find an answer, please let us know. <laughs> Um, another question is, have you selected any offline robot programming and commissioning 3D systems so far? Sorry, you dropped it a bit there, Aaron. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Have you selected any offline robot programming and commissioning 3D systems so far? I, I guess we could say that the, the architecture is not yet set, but um, I, I don't know that there's plans for that quite yet. I'm, I'm not sure that we can answer, we have an answer actually for that at this point. So. And we have some more questions about the green screen. So they asked if it's done to account for the space environment where you would have nothing apart from the space station and obstacles. Yeah, so the, the lab that we're in um, is actually quite busy and it's quite heavily trafficked. So behind these green screens, there's a lot of um, a lot of other pieces of equipment that are just being pushed out of the way when they're not in use. Um, we wanted to avoid the uh, you know the issue of the AI triggering off of a background element rather than the actual robotic element. Um, so the green screen seemed like the uh, the, the quickest and easiest approach. Uh, on how to do that. What would be instances of fault detection and tracking scenarios conducted by Canada Arm 3? Chris? Yeah, um, in terms of um, fault detection, um, so certainly it has to identify its own internal faults in terms of how the functioning of the system, if any of the components they fail to power up or, or something like that. Um, it will need to be um, fault tolerant to the conditions that occur around it on the gateway. So um, like I mentioned, um, uh, with um, different sunlighting conditions, the modules will uh, bend and shift slightly. So you can't rely on um, purely your forward kinematics of your arm to get you to uh, the contact interface that you're going to pick up, you have to do some kind of endpoint sensing to close that loop. Um, and in terms of uh, tracking, um, everything that's on the station that we are inter uh, interacting with should be quasi-static, um, with the exception of free-flying uh, vehicles. Um, so for example, resupply vehicles, logistics modules, um, we will need, they'll come to a, a hover somewhere where the uh, robot can reach them. And then we will actually act actively track that, um, go in for a grasp um, and secure it. So same thing that Canada Arm 2 does today under crew control, we will need to do in an autonomous way for gateway. So one more question, what are the limitations or challenges for adding a source of light to aid during operation in low lighting conditions? Um, so the, um, for example, we have, or we're planning to have illuminators um, on the end effectors so that we can be able to um, turn on another source of light. The um, the real challenge is uh, power draw and heat dissipation. So every time you have the lights on, you're generating a lot of waste heat, which has to get out of the arm uh, somehow. So there, we need to be uh, kind of parsimonious 
in how we uh, add lights to the system. Okay, I'm going to, um, it looks like we're, we're about one minute away from uh, one o'clock. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank uh, my fellow panelists for uh, joining us here today. Um, I think it's been a great discussion. Again, I'll reiterate that uh, if you'd like to reach out, trail at mda.space, uh, just drop us a line. Um, and thank you for joining today. I really uh, appreciate uh, everyone coming to uh, check out our new and latest trail lab. Okay, with that, I will sign off. Have a good day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.